And I was doing something really fun this weekend as well. I was watching TV. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, Friday night, I was watching the uh, ceremonies for the introduction of the Olympics. And there was something that took place Friday night that kind of stuck in my mind as I was listening to John Legend and Keith Urban singing John Lennon's song, Imagine. You know, and, you know, the theme of the Olympics uh, this year and probably every year is unity. The idea is sports is this, this common mode that can kind of bring us all together like music and that kind of thing. So I was, as I was listening to them sing the, the song, it kind of stuck in my mind. And I, and I went onto the Internet to get the lyrics because I didn't catch all the lyrics. And so this is what it says, and it's kind of, uh, anyway, it says, imagine there's no heaven. It's easy if you try. No hell below us, above us, only sky. Imagine all the people living for today. Imagine there's no country. It isn't hard to do. Nothing to, to kill, nothing to kill or die for, and no religion. Imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you will join us, and the world would be as one imagined, no possessions. I wonder if you can, no need for greed, no hunger, a brotherhood of man, imagine. The one thing he doesn't say in here, well, he sort of does say, imagine that there's no God, you know? So... So, 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 John, so John Lennon's, you know, I mean, the guy was a genius. He comes up with this song. It's like a very famous song. You know, the idea is that there's going to be unity, you know, no religion, no institutions, no. But, but the problem is it's not going to work. It, it's, it's, it's pure humanism. It's not going to work. It hasn't worked. It will not work. It will never work. You know, his imagination, it just is not going to work. And what I want to do this morning is I want us to look at some section, a section of Ephesians. So if you have Bibles or if you've got your phone Bibles, you know, and however you want to, you know, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to be focusing on verses 14 through 16. And I want to look at some ways in which we as Christians some suggestions about the interpretation of these verses that also will not work. And the reason it won't work is because we're misinterpreting what Paul is saying in this text of Scripture. Let me read it, and then we'll dive in. I'm actually going to start a little bit earlier, if you have your Bibles. I'm going to start at verse 11. Paul says, Therefore remember... That at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, well, what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separate from Christ. The assumption being made here is that the, the Jews were not separate from Christ. The Jews were in Christ. And then he's, what he's going to say is the Gentiles are now going to join in with them. Alienate it. Um, that you were at one time, Gentiles were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. And the next phrase is the phrase where there's a lot of interpretation that that turns on the the idea of reconciliation um, and that we're going to deal with this morning. And might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, 
thereby killing the hostility. So what I wanted, the question that I asked last week and the question that I've asked, I've been asking for a number of years, theological question is, why is it that we as evangelicals, what is it in our theology that allows us to be so complicit for generations with social injustice? And I think we can see in this text maybe some insights as to why that is because we misinterpret the text and we misunderstand what Paul is talking about. Let's, we misunderstand Paul and Pauline theology. So let's, let's pray and then we'll open up and talk about some of these things. Father, help me to make clear, help, this, help the folks, I was going to say students, <laughs> help the folks here in the, in the church um, understand what this text is saying. Uh, Help us to really see the implications um, on social justice and racism and those kind of things. But more importantly, see the greater call that God has in this. Way beyond reconciliation horizontally, but this reconciliation, this restoration to you for your glory. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So Christian suggestions for unity... Using Ephesians chapter 2, verse 16, that will not work because they're based on a misinterpretation of the text. There are four ideas here that I want to kind of quickly share with you in terms of how we misuse the text. Historically, and, 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 I'm, a, and I'm a culprit, the text has been used to motivate reconciliation, racial reconciliation. I mean, it says it. It talks about it. It says, you know, that, that we might reconcile us both to God, Jews and Gentiles, and, you know, and people of European descent and people of African descent. You know, it, and the first time I saw this was my junior year in seminary, 1975. Um, I became a Christian in 73, the end of my year, my senior year in college, and then I did corporate for two years. And I was thinking about doing uh, kind of a corporate thing, and that just wasn't, wasn't me. And so I ended up going to seminary in 75. And I really hadn't read the whole Bible yet. I, I didn't even read the whole New Testament. I had never read Paul's letter to the Ephesians. And so I'm in seminary, and the, the fire hose was going, and they're blowing me away. And, and I'm trying to keep up with all these Bible college grads. And, um, and I came across the letter to the Ephesians. So I read through it, and I came to this passage in verse 16 where it talks about reconciliation, you know, bringing folks together. Now understand, I went through the civil rights movement. You know, I remember my senior year in high school when Martin Luther King was killed, and there were riots all over the place. You know, 20 miles south of us in Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware was under martial law for 11 months. You hear me? They just about burned the city to the ground. We had race riots in our town. My my high school, there were race riots in our town in the, on the front lawn of our high school. I remember one time when uh, a couple of us were, um, I, don't know if, I don't know if you guys did this. I mean, like, we would, um, it was a small town. It was like about eight blocks, you know, and we would, you know, the guys, we would we'd get in our car and we'd check town, you know, like, <laughs> Yeah, did you check town, you know? And uh, we're the three of us, and we're in the car, and we're riding around. First, you ride this way. You see, you know, which, where, you know if any girls were walking, you know. And, it, and then you, you turn around, and you go the other way. It's just high school, you know? And then um, we, we decided to drive by the, the, the high school. And as we drove by the high school, we saw on the front lawn of our high school an eight-foot cross burning freaked us totally out. Of course, we ran to the police, you know, and, and, uh, and reported it. But, you know, so the, I remember those days. I remember we had all these, these horrible uh, experiences during those, the late 60s and, and uh, in college and even in the early 70s. And so when I became a Christian, it was a big deal the end of my senior year. When I went to seminary, it was a big deal. When I read this text of scripture, it was a big, and I was like so excited, like, oh my goodness. The the Bible addresses this problem that we have. So my junior homiletics class, the preaching class, right? First year homiletics. I picked this text and I tried to preach on it. Now you gotta remember, 
I'm an ex-hippie, you know, <laughs> like, uh, I got a big fro, you know, bell bottoms, you know, flip-flops, you know, the, we didn't have a dressing code. And I, I preached on this text, and I'm tr- well, I tried to preach on it, and talk about racial reconciliation stuff, this is 1975, and Earl, Earl, I'm not going to say his last name, but, cause I, but I do remember, <laughs> Earl came up to me. Now, Earl was a Bible college grad. He knew the Bible. I didn't know what I was talking about half the time. But Earl was a Bible college grad, and he, was, he wore suits to seminary, you know? He, wore, he, had, he carried a briefcase. The, the boy had high water pants, white socks, you know? And I'm thinking, this guy is really smart, you know? <laughs> and Earl came up to me, and he said, you know, you can't use that verse to talk about racial reconciliation because this is only talking about Jews and Gentiles. And I was like, I was like depressed. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you mean the Bible doesn't address this problem that we're struggling with in in our society? You know, but eventually I just ignored Earl and I jumped on the bandwagon with everybody else and I tried to use this verse to talk about racial reconciliation. But the reality is Earl was right. It's talking about Jews and Gentiles. It's not going to talk about... People of African descent, Americans of African descent, or other Americans of European descent being reconciled together. As a matter of fact, the term in verse 16, reconciliation, isn't even talking about the reconciliation on a horizontal plane. These folk to these folk. Now, it is saying, it is saying that uh, after the walls were broken down, after the, the law was made obsolete, but then... But then those, those terms, and I don't want to get too much into the weeds of the, of, the, of the grammar, but those terms call for action that would take place later. The reconciliation would be something that would take place later. So, so that's the one section, that, uh, the one int- uh, way of interpreting this text that I think has caused problems because it, it's not so much that God isn't going to, teach us in scripture about reconciliation. He gives us plenty of material to to use to talk about it, but not this text. This text is talking about something far more important, far greater. Now, the second one um, that's a misunderstanding of what the text is, is saying is that the Jews and the Gentiles are being saved the same way. The idea is that the reconciliation term here is talking about salvation, but it's not talking about salvation. You know, now I'm, I want to read a, a section from, and sometimes when I, when I reference this guy, I feel bad. I reference him very often in classes at Northwestern, and I'm going to reference him here. And one of my seminary professors told me years ago, uh, if you're going to quote somebody in a book, you know, or article that you're writing, or if you quote somebody in a sermon that you're preaching, you know, only use dead people. <laughs> because, but this guy's living still. But, but I, so I always feel like a little bit, you know, like, because I respect the man. I went to his church for seven years. He's one of the greatest expositors of scripture that I've ever sat under. But in this sense, the guy is wrong. His name is John Piper, and some of you have probably heard of him. In his book, Bloodlines, he says this about verse 16, 14 through 16. He says, there are not two saving covenants. There are not two saved peoples, Jews and Gentiles. And the reason is that there are not two ways to salvation. Assumption, the text is talking about salvation. There are not two saviors, two crosses. There could, there could, uh, what could be clearer than this? Christ has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility that he might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross. Ephesians 2, 14 to 16, Jews and Gentiles are reconciled to each other by being reconciled to God. Now, now listen carefully to what he's saying. Jews and Gentiles are reconciled to each other by being reconciled to God. In other words, if you are reconciled to God and I'm reconciled to God, then we're automatically reconciled to each other. I ain't feeling it. I don't think that's, I don't, that's not happening. 
through the cross. One way to God through, for, for both of us, not two ways, and we go together or not at all. So there is one saving covenant, the new covenant, in the blood of Christ. In believing on Christ, we're reconciled to God, and being both reconciled to God through Christ, we're reconciled to each other. There is no clearer text in the Bible, it seems to me, than verse 16. Now, this, now listen carefully to this next couple of sentences. Concerning the indivisibility of reconciliation to God through the death of Christ and the reconciliation to each other of all people groups. Now, he's already, he's, he's taken an extra leap of all people groups. All, all people groups aren't mentioned here. Just you, who come to God through Christ. Vertical and horizontal reconciliation happen together and inseparably through faith in Christ. Now, there's two things wrong with this, two assumptions or two things wrong with what, uh, what JP is saying here. One is, he's saying that if you're reconciled to God, then we're already reconciled to each other. That's not real. That's not reality. All believers of color who are reconciled to God and all believers of European descent who are reconciled to God are not reconciled to it. Man, that's, how, how hard is it to see that that's not a reality? And the other problem is that's not what the text is saying. So, so, this, so it's a problem. So it's a problem. All right, so there's, there's three. The motivation for reconciliation, we're saved the same way, and that being saved, being reconciled to God automi automatically reconciles us to each other. The fourth problem in the way people interpret this text, and, and one of my own colleagues, and I'm not going to mention some names here this time, one of my own colleagues at, 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 the, at the university takes this position, and maybe some of the other guys do too, I don't know. Good friend of mine, but he takes a position, and I think he's wrong. But also a really good friend of mine that teaches at Southern University, uh, Southern Baptist down in Louisville, also takes that position. And you know, we've talked about it. He read my book. I read his book. We've interacted around it. And you know, I think he's wrong. And, and what he's saying is we are automatically reconciled. This text is saying that we're automatic. So any intentionality to work on reconciliation is unnecessary. We're already reconciled. He said, you know, that we might be reconciled to each other. So anything that we do in order to intentionally actually work on this thing in our society is adding to the gospel. See, the gospel already reconciled us to each other. Now, you can see how, like I said last week, this gives cover. It gives cover to continue, continue systemic racism within the context of society. Because we don't have to do anything. We already reconcile. I'm saying, I ain't feeling it. And a lot of other people aren't feeling it. That's a problem. And I think it's wrong. Right? So it gives cover. So those four ideas are problematic when it comes to interpreting this text. So how do we interpret this, interpret this text? Well, the first thing we've got to do is we've got to understand Paul's thinking, the Apostle Paul. All of these options are based on a misunderstanding of Paul. Paul, now, uh, you know, some, this is the thing that my wife tells me not to do, but I always do it anyway. And she says, don't throw out these big theological terms because people, you know, it's like, but I know that you, you guys are all sophisticated. So <laughs> I'm going to throw these terms out anyway. Paul is thinking the lens through which Paul is using to look at Scripture and to write Scripture is eschatological, meaning the plan coming together. There's a plan that God has put together, and the plan, it's like, isn't it great when a plan comes together? Remember the, the, the A-team, right? Isn't it, isn't it great when the plan comes together? Well, that's, that's the eschatological. That's what, that's what Paul's talking. That's how Paul is thinking, right? But since Luther, and maybe before Luther, but what, what I trace it back to, to that brother, 
good brother, but you know, he has some stuff he messed up on. And this is one of them. He, he has influence to think soteriologically, in other words, salvation stuff. So everything we read is about salvation, but it's not. As a matter of fact, most of the Jews that were hanging around Jesus weren't even thinking about salvation. They were thinking about, hey, when the kingdom comes, where am I going to sit? Am I going to be in the right hand, left hand? You know, they're thinking eschatologically. They're thinking about the plan coming together. Where, 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 where's my role in the, in the new kingdom? They're thinking kingdom. They're thinking plan come together. And that's the way Paul was thinking. Paul was complicit at the stoning of Stephen. You remember Stephen? Jewish guy, became a Christ follower, preached to a whole bunch of Jewish, Jewish leaders in, in, in Acts, was Acts chapter 8 or 7, 8, I think. He lays this whole, this whole history, going all the way back to, to Abraham in, Macedon, in uh, Mesopotamia, like lays this whole thing out. And, and the Jews got upset, and they stoned him, killed him. And Paul was complicit. They laid their coats at Paul's feet. Paul was complicit. As a matter of fact, he had gotten a letter from the high priest that said, if any Jews who are turning their back on the plan of God to use the nation of Israel to rescue humanity and become Christ followers need to die. And so he, so he got a letter and he was taking people to the arenas. And they were getting eaten up by the lions and dogs and stuff. That was Paul. But shortly after that incident with Stephen, Paul was on the road to Damascus. And God struck him down, fell off his horse. You know, maybe that was, that was Luther who fell off his horse. I, mean, I don't know, it didn't say that Paul fell off his horse. But anyway, struck Paul down, and, uh, and, he, and he was blinded. And, uh, and so they took him, the next chapter, they took him to some, some Christ followers, and they, they shared the gospel with him. He received the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. The scales fell off, and Paul suddenly goes, for 2,500 years, we've been waiting for the seed of Abraham. And all of a sudden, you realize, Jesus is the guy. Jesus is the guy we've been waiting for. And so he goes into the wilderness for three years, and he writes 11 or 12 uh, documents that become the foundation for Christ-following Christianity. But, it, but, it's, but those documents, the theology, grows out of Judaism. And it has Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, in, at the center of it. And it does talk about, it does talk about salvation. It does talk about uh, relieving our, uh, uh, Jesus dying on the cross to deal with our sin. But the primary lens that Paul is using is an eschatological one. And the letter to the Ephesians is eschatological all over it. It's all through it, all throughout this letter. It's about the plan coming together, the plan that God has. So all these options have a misunderstanding of Paul. And the term reconciliation in verse 16 of chapter 2 is really talking about the restoration. The restoration, now let me read, let me read it. We'll start at verse 14. Now, if you've got your Bibles, take, watch, follow with me. Now, I'm reading, reading from the ESV. It's very similar to the, to the um, New Revised Standard that you use here. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law and commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself no one new man in place of two, so making peace. And he might reconcile us both to God in one body. So here's the issue. The Jews and the Gentiles, he's not talking about salvation because they're already saved. He's already, he's, a, he's, he's, a, he's, he's emphasized that early on, all the way back in chapter one, really, of, of Ephesians, but particularly in chapter uh, two after verse four. But God, who is rich in mercy, saved us. But God. So they're already saved. He's not talking about salvation. What he's talking about is not a, the, the horizontal relationship, one person to another, but the vertical relationship, the restoration of this new man, a, new, a newly minted humanity that's made up of believing Jews 
and believing Gentiles who are now in one body and they are being restored back to God into, and being made into a temple. The first place you see the temple appears in, in Genesis 1 and 2, the garden, the place where heaven and earth meet. That's the temple. And this temple is being restored made up of believing Jews and believing Gentiles. And so he follows these verses with, and he came to preach peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit through the Father so that um, you are no longer strangers and aliens, you Gentiles, but are fellow citizens with the saints, members of the household of God, the, the community of believers. The, the, the members in the covenant that God made with Abraham, this new community, this new Adam that God is in the process of, of building, built on the foundation of the, the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone, the cornerstone of what? This new temple that God is establishing. Um, in whom the whole structure, now, now, now follow, follow the, the verbs in, in, in verses 21 and 22. The whole structure is being joined together. It's not a complete, it's not a complete action. This is action that's in process. The new temple is being built, being established, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Where, where heaven and earth meet, where God promised to dwell with his people. In him, you also, Gentiles, are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by his spirit. You see, that's, that's the eschatological plan that's coming together. That's what Paul's talking about. In, in, he's not talking about, he's not talking in verse 14 um, 16, rather, about salvation. They're already saved. So the word reconciliation isn't talking about that. It's talking about the restoration, the new community, the, new, the, new, the newly minted community of, of humanity made of believing Gentiles and believing, believing Jews who are now being established um, as a new temple, the, the new temple replacing the, 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 old te the first temple, the, one, the Garden of Eden, which was the temple. And if you look at the whole, uh, the, the, the history of the temple throughout the, old, the whole New Testament, the Old Testament, it really, kind of really, it really makes sense. It really comes to fruition, of course, it, in, the, in Revelation 21 and 22 when the temple is established. That's what God is doing. And when we get there, and when we get there, when the whole plan that comes together and you are a part of it, You'll be able to look at the temple and you say, I can see that brick right there. That brick represents my life. That brick represents me and my life's journey, my story to be part of this community that God is building. That's what it's all about. It's way bigger than racial reconciliation. It's way bigger than that. It's about the plan of God coming together and the temple being established that we're all a part of, and, and uh, in, 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 um, infinitely involved in that plan that God is doing. That's what it's about. And if we, like I say, go back to the first question I'm asking, what is it about our theology that allows us to be complicit with social injustice? And part of it is that we, we jack these verses up. We've tried to read into it what we want to see. Rather than look and see what God is saying and then live lives consistent with the revelation from God that's given to us in this, in this, in this text, the special revelation of God. And if we do that, the whole racial reconciliation thing will be taken care of. It doesn't mean we ignore it, but it, but it will be addressed. And we will be addressed in all of its minute details so that we can ultimately be that community that God called Adam to be in Genesis 1 and pick up that task that God gave to Adam to manage the entire creation for God's glory. That's what it's about. 
That's what it's about. Let us pray. Our Father, we do thank you. We praise you for who you are and what you're doing in our lives. We praise you for your word that you've given us, the detail that you've given us about who you are and how you want us to think. We thank you for the, 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 the apostles and the leaders that came before us all that laid this stuff out. Help us to be Berean. Help us to truly study the scripture, make ourselves approved for, for God, for his glory. That's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.